I get all the messages from the people waiting on the live stream. Now what's going on? Hold that up to your face. We'll try not to talk at the same time. Testing, testing. This isn't working. Hello, hello, hello. So you just have to turn it on. Modern technology. Hello. <laughs> All right. Good morning. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. Sorry, everyone on the live stream, if you were sitting there going, this is not working. We're, um, we're a little bit late. Uh, Hello. We are exactly where we need to be at this time. Five minutes, six yes. minutes. Yeah. All good. All right. So... We're morning startup. Thanks for coming down on such a rainy, miserable morning, getting yourselves out of bed. Uh, my name is Scott Glue, and I'm Dave Newman. We've been doing this since 2011. Something like that. A little while. Yes. So every two weeks, rain, hail or shine, we will put on an event with some cool speakers so you can learn about startup related topics and get to meet everyone in the room. Hopefully you're all like founders or in the startup game or interested in AI and IP, which is the topic that we've got on for you today. Um, and yeah, we just do this for sort of startup therapy, really. To we do it so that you hopefully don't make some of the mistakes that we and others have made during our life in building a business, and hopefully yeah. to partake some of that information across to you. But we have a format, and that format is, if you're new here, and we know who's new because we know the faces is to uh, stand up and introduce yourself and if you are working on a project or a new business and we want to hear it and as in true startup fashion have an ask so what is it you're looking for how can we help and we often see when we have these people stand up and introduce themselves with an ask somebody else will go ah oh, i can help you with that so uh, who's brave enough to stand up and introduce themselves because i will point because i know who's new so we've got one over here all right here we go hey everybody uh, my name is Eduardo. I recently moved to Perth from New York, um, and I recently got hired to be a startup lead at RAC's incubator called Better Labs, um, basically hunting for a problem to start a startup around. And part of the process is looking for a partner to start it with, and I'm in the process of trying to find that partner. Um, ideally, someone with technical background. My background is in growth marketing, community marketing. So looking for someone who's up for helping me build something Any fun. Any developers in the room? Techie people? They have the coolest jobs, don't they? They really do they have to come with the problem or do you have the problem already? We will have to find the problem. Yeah. yeah. I, say, is there any way, I know how it works. Uh, are there any problems that you're kind of focusing on at the moment? Uh, nothing really clear or certain. That's all good. Uh, I, I love the, uh, the Better Labs model. It's, uh, AI, legal it's, it's, issues, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who, who else is uh, cool. brave enough to stand up and uh, introduce yourself? Gentleman in the back. Awesome. I'm get my steps. Think, even though Dave's mic isn't turned on through here, it's working for the light. Hello, button. everyone. My name is Mohammed Hamzali. I hope this mic is working. <laughs> Nice. I moved in here from Oman just this year. I am currently was pursuing research in AI, machine learning, and I'm building a startup around it. The idea is to find malicious actors in ChatGPT, so I'm working an extension based around that. And turns out, well, I have a software engineering background, currently project lead with SecDim based out in Sydney while pursuing this on the side. So I thought machine learning, hey, couldn't be so hard, right? And here we are, <laughs> apparently <laughs> a lot more than I bargained for. So currently, I suppose the best thing I'm looking for is anyone who has expertise in machine learning to help me out a bit with this project. Otherwise, uh, apparently there is a need for it. Everyone uses ChatGPT, so why not? Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much for coming down. Brilliant, yes. Anyone else brave enough to stand up? I, I had a great chat with Celeste about who's like an aspiring founder. So I think she wants Celeste, come on. Celeste, you've been nominated. Yes. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Dylan. Really appreciate No, joking. <laughs> great, great to be here. Thank you. Um, thanks for having me. Um, I uh, am starting a uh, little dropshipping business called Femzone. Uh, it's targeted around um, fe uh, organic and um, natural products for women. Um, and so it's just a little... Um, Side initiative, I'm actually a project manager. I work for the public service 
Uh, so, um, yeah, I'm looking to build my own little um, empire in the beauty space, and I'm also helping my husband um, start his new business as well. So, that's fun. Fantastic. So, yeah, I've got, I've got a lot of learning to do. Are you looking do, for anyone so. in particular? Any help? Or... Um, I'm probably going to be looking for a lot of help soon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just not sure uh, in what order I'm going to be needing it. So, early days for me, just sort of working uh -huh. out, each, <coughs> taking one step at a time. Um, but, um, yeah, so I am probably going to be looking for some help in the um, uh, online marketing space in the early sort of stages. That's what I'm working on, skilling myself, upskilling myself in at the moment. So. All right. And femzone.com.au? Thank, Thank you. Yes, it is. Sweet. Thank you. Anyone else? One more person. Come on, there's going to be someone who's It's time to shine. Go on. No? no? Sure. Nice one. Go, Justin. Hi guys, my name is Justin Maxwell. We run a company called QMark Solutions and Software for You. We are always looking for developers and architects in the space. So anyone who wants to look into those roles, we'd love to speak to you. Thank you. Excellent. All right. Thanks very much, guys. So, so um, I found a sundowner. Found a sundowner. I, yeah. I had a rumor that uh, an old stalwart was coming back to Perth, and I saw then that my my rumors were true because they are RSVP yeah. to this. Yes, I caught up with Marcus. Yes. And people like Celeste. So come down to Founder Sundowner and meet cool people. It's uh, the first Wednesday of every month, if you're not a morning person, um, or it's raining or whatever, come down to Founder Sundowner. Have a drink and a pizza and chat with startup folks. Okay, so um, we want to thank the department of, I can never new remember the order. Funds. This is the new Jobs. The government, the tourism, jobs, science, tourism, and innovation. Jitsi, jobs, tourism, <laughs> science, and innovation. Um, specifically, I'd like to thank the New Industries Fund for sponsoring the streaming. We have um, in our regional towns like Joondalup and other places. Joondalup, Yanchep. Yanchep. Hello, they everyone are having a watch party down there. I always laugh when, they, when we say Joondalup is a regional town, but um, <laughs> they are watching from afar. And uh, hey, look, you could be here enjoying the free food and the coffees, but um, no. Thank That's you right. very much to them. If you haven't as well, while on this slide, before you move forward, mm. forwards, Innovator of the Year has recently been launched. So if you are working on something really cool, then go and check out the Innovator of the Year website and make sure that you apply because it's your way of getting what you're doing in front of uh, lots of people. It comes with quite a lot. There's about 200 grand's worth of, spon uh, of prize money this, this year for it. Ooh. So definitely get yourself along there. Uh, those of you who have also um, applied for the Innovation Booster Grants, I hear that that's been postponed a little, pushed out. There were so many applications that, uh, bless Charlie and his team, they've had to <laughs> kind of wade through them. So I think that uh, hopefully at some point time. this month they'll, they'll, they'll let everybody know. But that was great. And obviously you've heard about WAVES, which is the WA government's response to help bring more funding we've had the three recipients of the WAVES program in here talking about their funds, that being Purpose Ventures, Derek and Kylie and, and the team there, Glenn and Pierre and that from Fund WA and Nigel from Quokka. And if you missed that session, go back and watch it. It is available online. It was streamed uh, as to the three new investment funds that yep. are here in WA. On the live stream page, by the way, it's perthvideo.com.au slash morning startup Perth with hyphens, I think. Um, there's all of the past events this year on that page as well, if you're interested. Um, sweet. Speaking of growth marketing, people needing growth marketing, we have an amazing sponsor called Ammo. Celeste's on her phone. Just want to, Celeste, we've got, we've got Ammo. Check it out. <laughs> sweet, nice one. Um, yeah, so... Uh, they know their shit around growth marketing. Make sure you get on their, their website. Uh, they've also got an awesome podcast called Weird Growth and interviews with awesome people. Um, and... Glenn is here, so he can do his own. Okay, Glenn. Mic. Hey. Finally, let me move Glenn across. runs a let recruitment company mic. in Perth. They're awesome. I haven't seen you for five weeks, mate, so... Uh, keep it short, though. We're running out of time. Let's right, go. I'll, I'll keep it short and sharp. <laughs> um, for those people that are recruiting and if you're hiring uh, interns, thank you, I implore you to do that. So there's a couple of really good programs that some customers are doing. We can help you payroll and, and talk you through that strategy. So I know that's part one because you're cost conscious. And um, well done for being in one of the best countries in the world, guys, for uh, innovation and growth in and around technology. So um, there's some good things coming up this Ooh. coming financial year. So I'll share that later. That's awesome. short and sharp. Good one. Nice one, Glenn. <laughs> and Cheers. if you are looking for a job, then check out Beecham Group. 
Well, you are looking to recruit that person, Beecham. Uh, Jesse in the co from Keepspace, if you are an e-commerce platform or you do do drop shipping like you're about to do, then you need to check out Keepspace. Uh, they'll do your local sort of last mile fulfillment. Um, you basically have all your goods shipped to their warehouse and you sell it online via whatever Shopify or whatever system that you use, Squarespace, you name it. They will basically fulfill it for you. And also, I'd just like to thank Jesse for the beautiful food uh, at Keepspace for supplying it. The breakfast is sponsored by them. So yes. thank you, Jesse. Thank you, Jesse. And thank Keep you, Space. Keepspace. And we Tekken. have a new one. Whoa, madness. Um, we are now doing coffee. Or well, Techon is helping us do coffee. So if you're one of the thir first 30, 30 people, we've got 30 coffee vouchers. You just need to go out to Joey Zaza's out there and, and claim it. I think there's a couple still on the on the bench up there next to the food, um, but thank you very much for TechOn. Uh, TechOn, do you want to do the first first pitch? Sure, I'll do the first one. And I'll learn from you. <laughs> uh, so TechOn is your trusted staff augmentation offshore developer provider. So we specialise in working with startups. We are flexible, cost effective, really easy and simple to use. So if you guys are looking for developers wanting to build out a product or a app for your platform and you need a really cost effective way of doing it, come talk to me. I'm your gal. <laughs> Awesome, thank you very much. And uh, just a shameless plug, if you go to fastview.co, you'll see a website that was developed by the fine folks at TechOn. <laughs> um, all right, so <coughs> let's move along. Um, and a bunch of supportive organisations. We'll just, we'll just run through very, very quickly. We couldn't do this without SpaceCube because they give us the space. I just want to mention Startup News. Again, um, it's a really good way of getting information. Go and subscribe. Every Friday comes out a big nugget of information. Plus eight, they have, um, I think it's closed now, the... Mm. The, they're doing the short list of the ones. So if you have applied for plus eight, good luck. Hopefully you'll get through boot camp and get into the first cohort. But that is WA's uh, sponsored by Battle Labs um, Accelerator. So, and they also have plus eight sprint. So again, if you are looking to learn very quickly over a 12-week period, then go out and check out plus eight. Start WA, advocates for the government, and then tech board, good for kind of getting your announcements. Basically out subscribe to these three things. Go and hit up the website. Subscribe, and you get a bunch of information about what's happening in startup land in Perth. Sweet. Hit us up. We're morning startup on all the things. Love to hear from you. If there's something we can do better or worse or anything, or if you've got a talk that you'd like to put or, on one or, day. Or a complaint. Yeah, no, we don't want to hear those. <laughs> awesome. Dave, do you want to do it? Yeah, well, right, that's the uh, formalities out of... Formalities out of the way. Out of the way, yeah. It's, it's, it goes, it, like, I did on. this when you were away and it <laughs> fell like <laughs> no one gets it, it. alright so that's it from us um, and you're all here today to hear about um, AI or IP in the new age of AI we've got a guy who's been going deep into this stuff over the last four months forever it's, a, it's an interesting and topic for sure because if, you if you've ever played with, who's played with ChatGPT who knows what, who's heard of ChatGPT if you haven't, then you've been under a rock. But um, if you have, it's an interesting conversation because if ChatGPT, whilst it constructs its own view on it, who owns the IP on the view, on the information that it's given you if it's trawled it from the likes of Yelp or other places like that? And should it give you citations? So I think this is going to be an interesting area for all IP lawyers. And I think there is definitely going to be some really big test cases in the coming years that will flush out essentially who owns it. Again, if, if um, one of the conversations I heard is just that if the AI gives you 10 recommendations and it's built on reviews of it, how is that any different to a reporter writing it and doing their own research from it? So again, it's, it's going to be an interesting topic. So I'm looking forward to it. Without further what ado, please make him welcome, David Wilson. Woo! Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Dave. So... Thank you. So my name's David Wilson. I have a little law firm called Strato Cumulus Legal. Um, you're wondering where the name came from. Well, if I called it Fluffy White Cloud Legal, you wouldn't take me seriously. So I thought I'd better come up with something that sounded a little bit technical. Um, I work out of um, Space Cubed Fern, just up the road, and my practice focuses on intellectual property in, in lots of different forms, but I've taken a real interest over the past couple of years in... Um, well, it's now called generative AI, but before it was called that, it was what happens when your robot 
create something. Who owns the IP rights? In that, so I thought it was a great topic to talk to startups about. What are the implications for you when? Oh yeah, sorry. Let's get to that first. That's more important. Um, I did a presentation a while back for some people who build robots, and I thought I needed to prove that I can build a robot too. So. Um, my robot's even sentient when my seven-year-old son gets inside it, so I reckon, it's, I reckon it's pretty cool. It's cardboard boxes. We went to Spotlight and got craft supplies and worked out really well. Um, acknowledgement of country, it's a really good way to start an event, so I'd like to acknowledge that we meet on the land of the Wadjuk people of the Noongar Nation and pay my respects to Elders past, present, emerging and acknowledge any uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are here or on the live stream this morning, um, I always like to extend an acknowledgement of country art to make it a bit more meaningful into some topics that relate to the work I do. And so there's a couple, a couple of things to share with you that may even have some segue into AI technology in the future as, as things develop. But one thing intellectual property doesn't do very well is look after um, indigenous cultural and um, intellectual property. So traditional knowledge, it's something that the, our Western-based legal system really doesn't handle comprehensively, maybe in bits and pieces here and there. But um, So there's two things to share. Um, one is at a Commonwealth level, IP Australia, which is a government agency that administers IP laws in Australia, is currently conducting a scoping study on standalone legislation to protect and commercialise Indigenous knowledge, and that's a big development. So we've heard a lot about... Um, we've heard a lot about the, um, the voice re um, referendum that's going to happen later this year, but this is also a little bit under the radar, and I think it's a really key development that goes a long way towards um, recognising ind Indigenous culture and, um, and, and acknowledging and paying respect to it and, and giving something back to those who, um, who are the custodians of that. And also in Western Australia, this is new to me, I just learned about this last week, I don't know anything more about it much than that quote on the screen, but there's currently a consultation process towards a biodiversity bill that would share in the benefits when traditional knowledge of a genetic resource has been shared and used by a biodiscovery activity. That's really interesting stuff. So you're thinking of you know, the cure for cancer or some scientific discovery that involves um, plants and, and things. Um, that's not the world I work in, but I just think that's really interesting. So back to our world. Um, I asked Crayon. I, it was cheap. I didn't have paid credits to get a great AI image, so I just got a free one off the internet. But I asked Crayon to build me a legal warning sign. So it's not bad. It's sort of an attempt at doing the scales of justice on a, on a road sign. I thought that wasn't too bad. But I just want to get the legal formality out of the way. Um, I don't have a client relationship with any of you as a result of this presentation, so um, just don't rely on my, as this as being legal advice. And if you've got any questions, I'm happy to take them on the fly. But if you've got anything specific to your particular legal problem that you're facing at the moment, come and have a chat afterwards or talk to a lawyer afterwards. Um, just don't air them publicly because it um, could be to the detriment of your own confidentiality, not, not, uh, not necessarily uh, anything else. So, startups and AI and IP. I think we've heard it before. Startups sometimes build their business plans around, it's my IP, I'm going to build a business around it. And I know you guys have had presentations on IP before, so I'm going to try and take a little bit of a different angle today, which is, as Scott said in the introduction, um, it's the artificial intelligence side of this that is really new and challenging for IP lawyers as well as the, as the broader business community. I've been interested in these two questions. Who owns the IP rights in a robot's output? And can a robot, on the flip side of that, can a robot infringe somebody else's IP. And I think there's some really interesting issues that come up in looking at those two questions. Uh, let's talk through it and at the end we'll do a summary of just how that might impact any of your businesses in terms of what you're doing. Because you're thinking, oh that's all big tech stuff, how does that affect me as an everyday small business or as a startup? And I think there are going to be some implications coming through already. I have a question by Robert, you mean that the hard AI, the reinforcement learning, or I use the word robot in a very, very broad and generic yeah. sense. Yeah. So don't, don't, don't think I take any particular technique. So I'm a AI as well. Yeah, yeah. 
of course. I, I, I'm a lawyer, not a, not a tech person, so I'm sorry, I'm probably using some terminology in a way that might be different to you guys, so be, bear with me if I say something in a strange way. Um, as a refresher, there's no single thing as IP, and sometimes here in the business community, the term IP just used amorphously to, you, to mean anything that's sort of in somebody's head. Um, lawyers will have a different meaning to that, and um, those are the sort of the key, that's not, that's not an exhaustive list, there's a few other things that I haven't put on that list there, but those are the key things that a lawyer will deal with when it comes to um, intellectual property. And they each have their own features and benefits and rights that are, and, and the way they operate that are different to each other. So a patent protects an invention. Um, I'll come to Dabas as we, as we get through. Um, copyright protects expression in material form. So it's not the idea or the concept itself, it's only, when you, it's only when you fix it in some sort of storage format or write it down. And you've got to think that with copyright, it all evolved in the analogue world with pre-digital technology and we're trying to stretch, stretch the law to fit digital technology as it's evolved. So we need to sort of think of copyright as printing presses and pencils on paper and paint brushes on canvas and then sort of evolve it out from there. Um, Designs, I'm not really going to talk about this morning, I don't think, but if it comes up, it comes up. Um, the word design, I think, has a very general meaning in everyday speech, but here we're talking about the shape and appearance of the manufactured product. So, you, I don't know, this little remote control clicker that I'm using to use the slides, that has a particular shape. If that was unique, then that might be registrable and protectable as different from the shape of any other remote control device, but it doesn't protect its functionality. Um, trademarks you're very familiar with, I suspect. Brand names, logos, could even be colour schemes and sight, smells and uh, sounds. But they're less common, but could be. Um, confidential information is something that I don't regard as a piece of property, and I'll come to that in a minute, but it's certainly proprietary in a, in a commercial sense. And those are all your trade secrets and your know-how and um, all sorts of different pieces of confidential information. And this is the scenario that over my career I've seen in many different forms and many guises, but this, this is what we're trying to avoid. So we often have two or more people in a business relationship of some sort. It could be contractors, could be joint venturers, employer, employee, whatever it is. And that's the period when the so-called IP is created. Everything goes along happily or, or not. But somewhere down the track, everybody goes their separate ways and we have a biffo because, ah, they're using my IP. And that's when the analysis starts from the lawyer's point of view. What is the IP? How does it fit back within one of those categories or, or some of the others? Um, who created it? Therefore, who owns it? Are there any contracts dealing with who's permitted to use it? And, and so on. And then we finally get up, after doing all that, we finally get up to the question of, well, is somebody infringing it as a result of all, all of those other things taking place? And that's a lot of work. Now, I enjoy that work. I, I like the analysis of it and working through all the legal questions to get to the answer. I like that, um, but you don't like it as a client because it's time-consuming and expensive. So that's what we're trying to avoid. Now, that was all background. First question of the two I'm going to pose this morning is who owns AI-generated output? Or, or to put it, you know, in my loose sort of talk, who owns the <coughs> creations owned by a robot? Has anybody got any thoughts? Anybody want to venture an opinion? No, no one owns it. There's no open source. Ah, spoiler. <laughs> spoiler alert. Um, I often hear, ah, oh, but if I own the if I own the device, I must own the I must own its output, or I programmed it, therefore. Um, I must own what it creates because I made it or I, or I coded it. And yeah, the answer is quite possibly nobody owns the IP rights in the output of an, of an AI device. So that is going to get us thinking a little bit about how are we going to protect and monetize the content of, that's generated by AI and um, how do we need to behave in our businesses differently to, um, to the way we had previously, given that that sort of paradigm is, is shifting and changing? One of the things with 
particularly with AI-generated content, we're probably looking at copyright law more than anything. And one of the touchstones for copyright law is authorship. The law says the person who created or is the author of a particular work is the person who in turn gets to own the, the copyright in it. And this has been a question that's been going around for 140 odd years now. And I, I was writing an article recently in which I was looking at this in the context of AI, but came across this great legal case from the 1880s back in the UK um, about who owned the copyright in a photograph back in those days. And the fo I don't know if this is the actual photograph. Um, I couldn't quite link it up with my research online and, and the case, but it could well be. The, the, the case was about an Australian cricket team that was touring England in 1882. So I found this photo online. If it's not exactly the right one, well, it's certainly the right time frame, I, I assume. And I think I'm pretty safe in using it because copyright subsists for the life of the author plus 70 years. So I think this one's probably been in the public domain for long enough that I'm safe to use it this morning. But think of, think of, the new, think of photography as a new technology back in those days. What did they have to do to take a photograph? Well, there had to be a mammoth camera. I'm assuming there was a hood that went over the photographer's head while he got under there and uh, stood in the dark. Somebody had to load the plate up. Somebody had to take the lens cap off. Somebody had to compose the, uh, the, subject, the subjects of the photograph and arrange everything. And back in those days, copyright had previously applied to artistic works like you know, paintings and drawings and that sort of thing. But to apply it to a photograph, which was all of a sudden a mechanical and a scientific process, really challenged the judge that was hearing this case. And what, what had basically happened in, the, in, in this case was the photograph had been taken, somebody thought it was a great idea to assemble the Australian cricket team, take a photograph of them and make some money out of the photographs, because you couldn't just run your own off in those days. Um, and a pirate. And the, the case actually back in those days uses the word pirate, which I thought was quite interesting, um, somehow replicated the photograph and started making some money out of it. And um, the question was who owned it. Um, the judge was really befuddled because he couldn't work out, well, but a photograph, it's, it's, it's taken, it's, the photograph is, is made by the sun, he says, <laughs> thinking of the scientific process involved. A human didn't make this thing. Nature made this, this image on, on the film. Right? Can you see where this is going and how, it, how it, we can draw back on this 100, 140 years later to, to AI? So basically the outcome of the case was that the, photo that the owner of the copyright, the author of this photograph, was the person who had made the arrangements to do it. Um, let's hold that thought because that's kind of interesting. But it just shows you that this concept of authorship has been around in copyright law and troubling people as new technologies have, em have evolved for a very long time now. Anyone remember this? This is much more recent. But it, it also shows the authorship dilemma with, with, with images. So this monkey is a macaque um, in the wilds of Sulawesi. Um, living in a nature reserve and a nature photographer was uh, doing a photo shoot over quite an extended period from what I understand and befriended, befriended the troop of monkeys. Now the, the story is, hang on, I've got a quote here. Let me just find it. Here it is. According to the photographer, now this, was, this, this part of it was never tested in court, but the photographer on his blog said, I put my camera on a tripod with a very wide angle lens, settings configured such as predictive autofocus, motor wind, even a flash gun, to give me a chance of a facial close up if, uh, if the monkeys were ever to approach again for a play. I duly moved away and bingo, they moved in, they, um, they pressed the buttons and fingering the lens. I was then to witness one of the funniest things ever as they grinned, grimaced and bared teeth at themselves in the reflection of the large glassy lens. Now, is, any, is that any different to making the arrangements for the photograph to be taken, same as, same as back here? I don't know. It was never tested in court. Um, what happened was the photo escaped into the public domain. I think it went up into Wikipedia. The photographer asked for it to be taken down. Wikipedia said, no, a monkey took this photograph. <laughs> and there's no copyright in something that's taken by a monkey. Um, Animal rights organisation got involved. There was litigation in the United States about whether a monkey is capable of owning copyright. 
And the answer to that was, well, no, you're not a human, therefore you can't own copyright. But the substantive question of is the photographer actually an author of that image by reason of making all the arrangements was never actually answered. But theoretically, I don't know, maybe, maybe we could come back to that sort of 1880s point. Um, in, in modern law, we sort of conceive of the person who takes a photograph as being the person who actually presses the trigger on the, on, on the camera. But maybe we can step back and, and think of it that way. So what if it's a generative AI instead? I, I tried to get my son take a selfie. It sort of almost worked. So that was that photograph. But um, presumably the same principles are going to apply as for the monkey, as for generative AI. Um, that's a better one. So I actually got Dali to, take the, to generate that for me a little while ago. And that was my prompt, a photo of a smiling red robot taking a selfie photo with a camera. And of course, when generative AI does it, it's not a photograph. It might be photorealistic, but it's, a, it's, it's an image, which is another distinction in copyright law, but it's probably not really interesting for you guys. Um, so I think what it comes down to is, are you using the software or the AI or the, or the whatever, whatever it is, are you using it as a tool to create? And that's not strict, using it as a tool is not a legal expression, but I think that's a good way to d describe the, the outcome. So I used PowerPoint software to create these slides. I don't think anyone's going to doubt that I own the copyright in, the, in my PowerPoint slides because, just because I used a computer to do it or because I used a, a word processor to type out a document. But some... A little over 10 years ago, we had a, we've started to have a few cases come through the system, not looking at generative AI yet because it's too new, but we have had a, a few cases where computers have done authorial work in, in creating documents. And one case we had 10 or 11 years ago, remember the great big thick um, yellow pages, white pages that everyone used to get dumped on their doorstep every, every year? Well, Telstra was trying to protect that for a while because a company what called Phone Directories Company, Proprietary Limited, I think what they were doing was um, reverse engineering the white pages by sending an offshore, getting operators to type, reverse engineer and type in all the, all the entries. That must have been a pretty dull job, but that's what they were doing, so that they could create their own online version of it that could be searched. Um, Telstra wasn't very happy about that at the time. He said, hang on, we own the copyright in this directory. Um, and it actually was held that there was no copyright in the phone directories. One reason why is because it was just a list of names, alphabetical order, that's all it was. There was no, um, there was no creative spark, intellectual endeavour. There was, there was a lot of laborious work that went into it, but there was no creative spark or creative endeavour that went into creating it, so it wasn't sufficient to be a copyright <coughs> work. But another question that came up was, all of the individual data entries, you know, when you register a phone number, somebody does a data entry at that time, that all get fed back into a central database. And that database was said to be the copyright work. Um, but really, that part of it, putting it all together and compiling it, that was all automated. And that was where the computer came in. And so there was a question around, well, was there any human who was an author of that database? And one of the judges in the case has, has, has sort of articula articulated it this way. So long as the person controlling the program can be seen as directing or fashioning the material form of the work, then there's no particular danger in viewing that person as the work's author. So, so far, so good. I mean, you can use a word processor or whatever it is and you'll own the copyright in your work. But there will be cases where the person operating a, a program is not controlling the nature of the material form produced by it. And in those cases, that person will not contribute sufficient independent intellectual effort um, or sufficient effort of a literary nature to the creation of that form to constitute that person as its author. So that's where the analogy to AI and generative AI is going to come in. Um, and I think before I... That's a great quote, but before I get to that, I think the, the other analogy is if I commission an artist to go and paint... Let's say I've got someone, um, someone sitting out here on the front. I say, can you please draw... I'll pay some money, but can you please draw a picture of the streetscape of the terrace for me? and the artist goes and does it, um, as the person commissioning the artist to do it, I might pay them for their work and I might put the you know, creative idea and spark in their head, but it's not my expression that the artist is actually putting into play. The artist is coming up with their own 
the, the picture or the artwork that the artist produces is, is their own expression of my concept. And at some point, if I keep giving more specific and more specific and more specific and more specific direction to the artist, I guess at some point it's going to tip over to be my work because I'm, I'm just telling them what to do. And maybe that's also the analogy to look at with generative AI. But we don't know because none of this has been tested yet. But those are sort of the ways we can, we can think about it. Dave, up the back, sort of question. Could you argue that when you give ChatGPT a prompt, you are essentially giving it a response you want? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think, I think the answer is maybe, but prompt engineering is a real thing these days, right? There's people employed to be prompt engineers. And it's, it's getting quite interesting. Um, I suspect, using my analogy of the artist, your very first prompt, you know, your generic question to chat GPT, please tell me about such and such, I suspect that's not enough. But if you build on it and build on it and build on it and build on it, maybe at some point you could arguably cross it over to that point. I don't know, it's going to be very factually specific. And, and that's also going to be the dilemma with all this, is how do you... Uh, if you've got two photographs, hang on, I know there's some more questions, I'll come to you. Um, if you put two photographs side by side, one's taken by a machine, one's taken by a human, how do you distinguish which is which? Which is one that has copyright applying to it, which is one that doesn't? That's, a, that's just a practical question. Um, one, one of them gets remunerated and one of them doesn't. It's, it's really a difficult... It depends on how much you lie about it, doesn't it, basically? Maybe, <laughs> maybe, but I can't encourage that, so... <laughs> yeah? Um, I've like worked in tech startups and I've built my own my business at the moment, I'm going to call it a tech startup. But um, really interesting, like we used to, because a lot of organisations are driven by policy, right? And some of them are written by lawyers for what guides what organisations do. And there's still so much fear and anxiety around the use of open AI, which is ChatGPT is a tool that's being built by open AI, right? Yeah. Um, and I've often had a lot of chats with some, you know, really switched on people and some I wouldn't say not so switched on, but they don't actually understand the internet and AI and these tools and how we're using them. But I've thought a lot about um, the information that we're feeding these models, right? Chat GPT mm -hmm. and AI, and what happens with that information. For example, I plug in all these questions and say, you know, here's my business model, here's what I'm building. Yes. And I build it here in Perth, but someone then, that information is in a model that then spits out. Sorry. Spits out to an entrepreneur in Tel Aviv who builds the same business. Have you ever thought, can you give us some yeah, advice yeah. or guidance around, around that sort of thinking? I'm really happy to. But I've got a section on the talk coming up in a, in a little bit about Jump the gun, stuff, in, input into AI. Can I come to that in a minute? Yes. And, and if I don't deal with it enough at the time, um, come back to me. Yeah, sorry. Oh, yeah. Um, a question which you may be covering later. Yeah. Uh, I don't I've got a big voice, I don't need that. <laughs> oh, yeah, I do? Okay, all right. Um, am I supposed to switch something on? Is that on? All right. Is that it? It's this guy. So just don't worry about that. Oh, okay. Um, uh, yeah, that's changing ownership. And I refer now specifically to, uh, to Facebook because Facebook says you put a photograph on, on our Facebook, we then own it. Um, now, is that legal or are they just bullshitting well, I, us? Firstly, it is legal <laughs> because they can make their terms and conditions whatever they want to. And, and you, you can choose to comply with them or not comply with them. That's the theory behind that. And Look, I haven't looked at it specifically for a long time, but, and I could be wrong, but I, I thought they say, not that we own it, but you give us a licence to use it for however we want, which is almost as much as owning it, but not quite. So it doesn't preclude you from continuing to use your photograph in other ways. You could, you could put the same photograph on a different social media or, or print it off for your own private use. It's not, it's not taking away anything from you, but it, it gives them a licence to use it for... for very broadly. Uh, and, and, seemi and seemingly other people as well, then, um, because it's a, it's a free for all. I'll give you a classic example, something that's happened in the last 24 hours, uh, and I agree entirely with this guy. Um, there's a, I'm a, an ex wedding uh, photographer, part time pro, um, and, uh, but my big deficiency in photography is, is lighting in a studio. I've never really done it much. Um, so I follow a guy who's a very good studio. Uh, photographer, uh, and we interact, and I say, oh, great picture, uh, this, that, there. and we've interacted for some months like this, uh, but one of his pictures, I thought, ah, oh, I can really improve on this by changing the lighting <laughs> format, which I did, and sent it back to him, and said, what do you reckon to this little bit of photoshopping? He said, please don't, please don't mess with my pictures, and he's absolutely right, and I said to him, you're absolutely right, but 
apparently you can if, 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 if he's made it a free-for-all through Facebook, which was how the communication was done. The answer is I don't know the answer because I don't know Facebook's terms and conditions well enough. Um, I wouldn't imagine, though, that just because it's online and available that some third party, some member of the public, can just download it and do what they like with it. I don't think that sounds right to me. Um, ultimately, it comes down to, partly comes down to Facebook's terms uh, as to what you permit when, when you allow your photograph to be uploaded in the first place and therefore what you allow for it to happen in, down the track. But as a member of the public, just taking... I know everyone... I know it's very commonplace, but um, just taking photographs and materials on, on, online and doing what you like with it... Because uh, I do As a lawyer, I can't, I can't... I can't. I do it all the time. Yeah, well, I, I, I've, got my ears, I've yeah. got my ears blocked. I, don't, I didn't, didn't hear it. <laughs> we'll also right. have um, half an hour of networking at the end where you can come and ask yeah, yeah, um, David yeah, let, any let's questions get into if you want to have a discussion. So. Um, this quote here, let's get back to it. So it's been on the screen for a minute ago. It's, it's provocative, right? We're both, cre we're both created and create. Why cannot our own creations also create? Now, that's not a philosophical text or a religious text. That was a quote out of a federal court judgment um, two years ago. It was, the, it was the headline um, quote. It was pretty exciting for IP lawyers that an artificial intelligence system can be an inventor for the purposes of the Patents Act. Now, that got swiftly overturned on appeal, so it's not the current law. But for a brief window, we had a flirtation in Australia with um, allowing artificial intelligence to be an inventor. It was pretty exciting. Um, in, in the end, that's not the case unless we have some legislative or legal reform and, and amendments to the Patents Act. But... For a while, that's what happened. And I just wanted to discuss this quickly to reaffirm that, firstly, you need to be human to be an inventor in Australia and, and many other most other countries around the world as well. But <laughs> let's have a quick... And I'm conscious of time, but let's have a, a quick run through it because um, these are the issues that we're going to have to deal with in any event. So Dabis was the name of the computer, deep neural network. Um, the, owner of the, the owner of the computer both the hardware and the software was a guy called Dr Thaler, and he disclaimed any involvement in the output of, um, of Dabis, the computer. And this was the patent application. You can see what I've circled in red there. Um, on the face sheet of it, it says, applicant is Dr Thaler, and the inventor is Dabis. The invention was autonomously generated by an artificial intelligence. Now, normally you'd put the inventor's name there, but they were trying to do that. The invention itself was a, oh, it's too small for you to read, I suspect, but it was a, a fractal container, was the title of it. It never went on to be assessed on its merits as to whether it was actually a patentable invention or not. The threshold question was, well, can a, can a non-human inventor be, the, um, uh, be permitted? Can we even have an application that goes through in that way? Um, the judge's reasoning for allowing it to go through, there was some really interesting stuff. One of, uh, some of it was sort of word games, in a sense. Um, I'm just trying to find my notes of the, of the list of things. So, we've never had a need for the word inventor as a thing before, but we've done it with other items. You know, we've had a dishwasher was a person, became a, became a machine. A lawnmower was a person, now it's a thing. Why not do the same for an inventor? So we need to get our heads around this new concept. That was one of the reasons. Um, but, but more substantively, um, machines have already been autonomously generating patentable results for some time. Um, it's, more, it's more likely rather than less that any inventive step, which is one of the substantive things you've got to uh, resolve to get a patent through the system, that any inventive step over the existing technology base will be generated by AI rather than human intelligence in the future. Um, that, those were some of the reasons as to, as to why it got as far as it did. So that was, that was kind of exciting. All right. Can a robot infringe IP? Now, this comes back to um, some of the input stuff that we were starting to have a few questions before. Conceivably, I think the answer is yes, a robot can infringe IP. And let's have a bit of a chat about this image. So this image was created by, I think, by Stable Diffusion. And you can see the replication of a Getty Images watermark there, which the which the, the model has obviously decided or, or replicated because it thinks that if you're going to have a, a sports image, you need that watermark over the top. Getty, there, there's some litigation in the United States at the moment, um, and one of them is Getty Images has sued, the stock photo people have sued Stable Diffusion 
for copyright infringement, not necessarily because the output photo, the output image is a reproduction of one of their stock photos, that may or may not be the allegation, but really more interesting to me is the allegation is you've scraped some, I think it's 12 million odd images off the internet, and, and all the rest, but 12 million of our images, and it, that was a copyright infringement for you to scrape those images and use them for the purpose of training your, uh, for machine learning training, and for training your model. Now the, the litigation is only in its very, very early stages, there's no outcome yet, I don't know where it's going to go, but that's a really, really interesting question, and I think conceivably, and that's in the States, not in Australia too, and I'm not an American lawyer and, you know, all those qualifications. But if that conduct happened here in Australia, could it be a copyright infringement? And I think the answer is conceivably yes. Um, if you load a copyright image or a copyright work into the RAM of a computer, even if you don't permanently store that image and, and, and retain it and store it, the mere fact you've loaded it into the RAM of a computer is enough to constitute a reproduction under the Copyright Act. Um, the next question is, well, just because something's on the internet, does that mean you can or you can't use it for that, for that purpose? And that's a bit of a similar legal question to the question we had before about Facebook images just a second ago, or images that you download from Facebook. So because it's online, does that mean you, you, you have a, effectively a licence, impliedly, to do that? And I think that might be one of the, the points that a case like this would turn on. I, I don't know. I don't know where it's going. But imagine... I'll, I'll come to your question. But imagine if you had to pay a royalty on every single copyright work that gets fed into machine learning before you're allowed to use it. That's going to be prohibitively expensive and it's going to stifle um, development at all. So that's a really pressing issue in this space at the moment and one that we... we, we should be watching. Yeah. And is there law somewhat around uh, users <coughs> or, or infringers, as they call, but yeah. basically like uh, using it for non-commercial? Uh, is there differentiation between commercial and non-commercial benefits? Maybe, maybe not. I mean, those are certainly the issues that they're going to be looked at. So, in the States, they have, um, as a defence to copyright infringement, they have fair use, which is a, a fairly, um, yeah, I don't want to say it's loose, but it's, um, uh, it's, it's, a broad, it's a broad term where lots of different factors are, are, are taken into account, including whether it's used commercially or not commercially, um, etc. Here in Australia, our copyright exceptions are much more rigid and, and narrow than that. We don't have an exception at the moment specific to machine learning. The UK does. The UK has a copyright, a copyright infringement exception for machine learning, but limited to non-commercial research and study. So at some point, if you, if you do commercialise things, does that mean that exception becomes undone? I, I don't know. I don't know the answer. But, but these are all the issues that do come into play. So if you were to... And then, beside copyright infringement exemptions, by the fact that you upload something onto the internet where everybody can see it, is that enough to say, well, yeah, come along and have a look at my image? Uh, or does that, or is, that, is that only a licence for somebody who's browsing the web to basically look at your image and load it into your browser when you're just surfing the web, but, but stop there and go no further? So these are all the legal questions that we don't know answers to yet, but um, they're in play. Seems to be leading towards a world where basically, like we, uh, you know, if we survive the, the the future, I guess, yeah, is that basically like humanity will, will not own anything other than AIs and robots. Well, uh, no one at the moment is at least saying AI is capable of owning anything, isn't it? L let's just let's just pull up on that one. But but given that what you showed in the you know, the judgment uh, early on, yeah, it says it. It's well, it doesn't say AI will own it, it just says nobody will own it. Uh, uh, if you go back a, a few, the, uh, where, where the, the court case was, the, the commissioner? Hang that on. one. Yes. Back, back here. No, no, forward, yeah. forward, forward. Go, go, go forward. There, that one. But that's been overturned. I, I, I put that up for dramatic effect. Um, that, that doesn't exist. <laughs> so, um, there's a question at the back. Let's take that one. Then I'll, then I'll... 
Well, I know we're sort of getting close on time. Do you want to hold questions to the end if you've got a lot yeah, to go right, through? Yeah, all right, let's or? hold questions to the end. I'm, 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 I'm nearly, I think I'm right. nearly there anyway. So I think that the thought paradigm we need to get ourselves into is this. Back when copyright was dealing with analogue technologies, you could walk into a bookshop, you could, a, you could pick a book up off the shelf, you could stand there and read it cover to cover. The bookshop, bookshop owner might get annoyed at you for loitering, but that's not a copyright issue, that's a trespass issue. And you could put the book back on the shelf and you could walk out, not pay a cent, and you've downloaded all this information into your brain, but there's no copyright issue involved at all. So that, that's the old world. Now with digital technology, and this is even before AI comes into the picture, but, but especially so now, copyright is much more about controlling access to documents. Um, that's, the, that's sort of the paradigm shift we've got to get ourselves into. And I, I've put this one up too. This is a very old case. I often hear from businesses, oh, but I, I own that information. That, that's my confidential information. It's my property. And I just wanted to deal with that as well. Um, I love this quote. It's, it's very wordy and it's very old. 1943. This involved aircraft in, in, in the 1940s. But, and it was a case involving the tax, the tax commissioner, which I love sticking their nose into an IP case. But to put it in a sort of gender neutral tone, a person with a richly stored mind is not for that reason a person of property. So nobody's capable of owning information in a legal sense. I get it that it's commercially valuable, there's no doubt, but it's not, it's not property. And the, the, the best part of this quote, I think, to illustrate that is um, when I communicate my information to you, do we both own it? Do I cease to own it? Now you do, but it's still in, still in both of our heads. So that's the legal conundrum with trying to own information. Now, there's other ways to deal with it, but it's, it's not a form of, strictly speaking, from a legal point of view, it's not a form of intellectual property. So it's only capable of being controlled so long as it's commercial, uh, so long as it's confidential, sorry, and you've got safeguards and controls and NDAs and everything around that to, to protect it. That, that was the point I wanted to make there. Um, because as we see data becoming more and more of a currency, um, who controls it obviously has a commercial advantage, but who owns it? It comes back to that question again. I think ownership is not the right way to conceive um, information alone. So at the end of that Dabas case, the full federal court ended with this quote, um, it would appear that some of these policy con considerations should be attended to with some urgency. Now, it's not very often we see the courts hurrying up politicians. It's usually the other way around. So I thought that was kind of notable. That's why I put a Parliament House little logo there to say, get on with it. But um, there's a lot to sort through. So in the meantime, I think the word intellectual gives a big clue about what IP law actually protects. The takeaways for this morning and for all of your businesses and startups and people operating in this space are subject to some of the qualifications and, and the nuances we've talked about, there's probably no IP rights at all in AI creations, that is if there's no human in, author involved. Um, and even if you do use AI as a tool and then you, 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 know, you, you use ChatGPT to create something then you human edit the next layer of it, yes there's a human involved but, but it's, it's fairly thin over the top of the, of the pre-existing non-copyright work. Um, and using copyright content without consent to train a machine learning model risks infringing copyright. That's probably three good takeaways from what we've been talking about. There's no doubt others. Um, implications, and I, I think, I had to think about it. I'm supposed to be really relating this back to AI, but they, really these are things you should be just doing anyway, AI or not. Um, if your business uses AI-created content, consider how that's monetized and protected because maybe you've got to think about that differently. But the rest of these points you should be doing anyway. Make sure you have consents to use copyright materials. You know, look at your contracts with your staff, your stakeholders, your contractors, third parties that your commission works to, your wedding photographers. That's been a, a hot burning copyright issue for many, many years. Um, you, want extra, you want extra photos run off and the wedding photographer says, ah, I've got the negatives. All those issues. Um, you, want to, you might want to start seeking warranties that AI is clear to be used and doesn't infringe third party rights. Now, I mean, in, in one sense, good luck with that because um, that's going to be pretty hard to get through, but it's the kind of thing we should be starting to think about. Um, and don't input confidential content into open AI uh, tools. And I think that's where that question was going a, a minute ago about uploading, uploading content. You know, it's grist to the mill of AI to be uploading. Is that, is that where your question was going a minute ago? Um, yeah, I think it's like how well we have the system's understanding of open AI. Yeah. Like something I'd love to learn. Um, 
I don't know the technical side of that in the slightest. Um, you in the room will be far more over. Yeah, I'm sure there's some great than, tech than founders here using but, the tool. But but you know, I, I, I had a client matter come in just recently, and obviously I can't give you the specifics of it, but it was dealing with somebody who had potentially uploaded confidential content into ChatGPT, naively I think, not nefariously, but um, had that breached confidentiality uh, obligations to third parties by doing so. And what were the legal implications of doing that? So that, that's something that's very much in play and I've, I've been dealing with clients in relation to. Um, general steps to take. I mean, these are all just general things you should be doing anyway from an IP point of view, but all the more so with, with some of the technologies we're talking about. Conduct an audit and keep a, a review and a register of what, AI, of what IP materials you have and are using. Um, review your, your rights, that is, agreements, and have a think about who created what and what rights flow from that. Um, uh, apply for any trademarks or patents that you might be entitled to, because that helps protect them, and uh, have some practices to appropriately protect your confidentiality so that it's not just all out there. Um, there we go. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any... So I think we've got time for, say, two or three questions. So I can see a few hands going up. So, question. Um, I got a question regarding blog articles. So if I write a blog article and someone rewrites that with AI, yes, how does that look in a legal sense, or could you sue that person or company for that? Well, it's like it's like any article you write, whether it's on a blog or in a magazine or in a newspaper or hard copy, digital, whatever. If you're the author of an article, you will presumably own the copyright in it. And then if somebody reproduces that without your permission, however that reproduction occurs on a photocopier using cut and paste with a, with a mouse, um, whether they sit down with, um, whether they sit down with a, a, an old quill pen and they handwrite it out, whichever way, that's still a reproduction of your work and they need your permission to do it. But is your question geared more to around if they were to change it? So you know, my understanding is if they use it as a basis to uh, research, it's like a reporter, that then that's... Understand. So, so the question is how do we prove it? If it's paraphrased but similar to your content. So, whether they've infringed your copyright is a qualitative assessment, and you have to you have to put the two side by side. Firstly, is there? I'll do it this way around. Yeah. Firstly, is there an objective similarity between the two? And the further away they are. Then, then the less likely an infringement allegation is going to be made out. The closer they are, the more likely. And somewhere in between is the grey zone where it gets really difficult to assess. And that, that's very true. It's, it can be hard to assess in some cases. And secondly, you have to actually prove copying. So if they've come up with something independently without seeing the original, then, then that's not an issue. I mean, it, it doesn't happen so often. It's, it's much less common. But you know, some of these music copyright cases you get about subconscious memory and you must have heard my tune on the radio many, many years ago and you've come up with some, you know, all, all that stuff. Those are really difficult questions to answer factually. But, but in theory, that, that, that's the answer. Um, so it seems like we're getting a major change in IP laws that are coming across because we're going to lose control of this really, really quickly. So my, my question to this is predominantly around uh, generating software and programs. There's been a question I've had for a, a while. If I hire a external software developer or I get a software developer from a previous software development company, they're mm -hmm. coming with knowledge that they would have built software at that company already. Yeah. What's the IP controls over that going forward? I mean, you talk about AI, I understand that, but if I'm sitting and I've coded something yep. and then I move from one company to another, my knowledge that the company that I worked for previously, they claim they own my IP and anything yes. that I build while I work there, but when I move to a new company, yes. I so, don't so download the it. The theory of it is, now whether this is happening in practice or not is a different, is a different issue, but the theory is... Good question. Yeah, it's a great question. And it comes up in not only... Acutely comes up in software programming and coding, but it, it, comes up, it comes up in many different businesses where somebody is commissioned to create something. I mean, it comes up with me and my clients. Who owns the copyright in the legal documents I create for my clients? I want to be able to use that document again and again and again for the next client when they ask me something similar. I don't want to start from scratch either. I get it. So it's a real tension between those two positions. Um, it depends on what your um, 
employment agreement says, but presumably that's going to say your employer owns the copyright in what you create during the scope of your employment. And if that's the case, then you're not supposed to take that particular copyright work to your next em employer. Un unless, gonna... unless, well, unless, unless it was open source and there was no copyright in the first place. And I know it's hard to prove, but that's the theory behind it. OK, we're going to call it there. I know we can probably go on with that. And those of you I know have got your hands up, what we'll do is if you want to come and speak to David... Come and have a chat afterwards. Come and have a chat afterwards, do that. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming along, especially today on this rainy day. I will be eating my shorts later because I said you. it's raining, we stream it, it's winter, it's IP, we're not giving away money or any VCs. There may only be 10 people here. But there's a great crowd this morning, so well done to everyone for coming out. We'll be back here in two weeks uh, yes. where we'll be talking about... We have this lovely gentleman down here, Dylan, Dylan Lamb, wearing the most colourful trip. Sorry, I don't have a slide for it, but he's got the audience back. He's matched his shirt to our, to our morning startup logo colour, which is very, very good. Um, Biohacked, growth ops for humans, business and tech. Um, I'll get you to give us the five second pitch if you like, but before we do, please thank David Wilson. Yes. That was awesome. <laughs> and now I'll get Dylan to tell you what's happening in two weeks' time. Thanks. Um, I've not been to a startup for I think probably about two years, but I um, live in Brisbane. I spent a year working for a um, e-scooter tech startup. Learned a lot about uh, running ops, like hybrid ops, so both software and hardware. Um, yeah, really cool. I'm back in Perth doing a bit of work, so just want to share a bit of my story. I'm a big fan of the Space Cube ecosystem. Learn a lot here, so come along in two weeks' time. Have a chat to me afterwards if you want to know more. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, and before Thank we go, there much. are a few more coffee vouchers down there and there's a bit of grub, so for help yourself, but yeah. we'll see you here in two weeks. Thank you very much. Thanks. See you then. Ciao. Yes.